Section 9 of Tales of the Uneasy by Violet Hunt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Lisa Reichert. The Blue Bonnet A little spark in a blue bonnet who fought like the devil at Preston. Boswell The tourists peered past the grey stone pillars of the gateway into the courtyard, paved with round cobbles, grass grown in between. The low sculptured doorway gave admittance to the old manor house that had so fascinated the lady of the party from the first moment she had cast eyes on it. Oh, this is a bit of the real thing, she had exclaimed fervently when, five miles out of Richmond, the road had ceased to follow the course of the swale, mantled all the way with heavy oak and hazel copses. They seemed to hang like heavy beards from the beetle browed face of the cliffs that shelter the east bank of the river. The very real thing, she had continued, as the wagonette turned out into the open moorland, and their town-bleached cheeks were bathed at once in the pure, sullen airs that roamed over it, softened and suffused with the tears of an April storm gone by. This is the real Yorkshire moor I've heard of, bare and empty, with not a single dwelling to be seen. Yes, there's one for as their conveyance dived down into the scarp of a hill, she sighted beyond the now familiar river which wound again into view, directly crossing their path, and the low bridge of quite modern construction which spanned it, the square mass of a house commanding the river-bank. It seemed to stand, bulldog-like, on the slight acclivity, posing as guardian of the ford at that place, which was certainly all that had served for crossing a hundred years ago so her instructive companion remarked to the eager lady. She grew more and more enthusiastic. "'John, I can't possibly pass it. I couldn't reconcile it with my historical conscience to go by without an attempt to see it. It's like a grey-haired woman standing stranded on the edge of the world, an old Ariadne of a house, waiting for ever by the side of the flood. Ask the driver what they call it.' "'Walburn Old Hall,' said the stolid Yorkshireman, flicking a fly off his horse's ear. Three blind, hopeless windows, which had been closed up for the tax, looked over the old garden garth. The eyes of the persons, looking thence, could have swept the stream and the narrow neck which formed the ford. The stone-flagged courtyard of the house was enclosed by buildings on all sides but one. On the west, looking towards the river, was a ruined battlement on which a man might still walk and survey the country round for miles. But it was now insecure, the inner rubble exposed. Clumps of wild mustard and garlic sprang from every cranny and crevice, and made a yellow blaze that lit up the grey substance of the pile. The lady, unable to contain herself longer, requested the driver to pull up and let them have a look. Her companion took out a guide-book and read aloud, as they sat in the break, in the streaming sunshine. "'Walburn Old Hall, fortified manor-house, dismantled.' "'I should think it was.' "'A poor cause. The old cause of all. Listen. Family of Donay. There's the shield on the door, evidently. See all that repoussé work? Only we can't read it from here. The book says— the ancient family of Donay, who beareth sable gulty, argent and a canton ermine. Yes, Guy Donay's tomb is in the church at Redmire, remember it? His feet are cased in brass-toed solarets. Above his lady's head are three shields of arms. She appears to have been a conyers. Well, they seem to be pretty well extinct now. The last Donay was out and killed in the fifteen. There were Donays in the Great Rebellion, Donays in the Gunpowder Plot, in the Rising in the North. Poor romantic dears! Yes, that's the plague of lost causes. They swayed the emotions so forcibly, and through the emotions the very lives of the old families, those that had any good in them. One imagines them, up to the very latest day, having an indistinct glimmering of their own original raison d'etre, that is, lands given in exchange for service, their modern representatives have lost even the glimmering. Well, oughtn't we to be driving on? Oh, no. After what you've been making out, I must have a try to see over it. I want to make out that blurred shield over the door. Ghoul's Argent and Canton Ermine, was it? They can but refuse us. 
the young couple alighted under mute protest from the driver and entered the courtyard the lady bold the man nervous deprecating they received forthwith a teniers like vision of an interior farm hands were sitting round a wooden table placed in the oak panelled greasy blackness of a low raftered hall all looked up and ceased pulling at their mugs a frowsy young girl of eighteen wiping her mouth came forward could we see over the glint of a silver coin in the lady's hand pleasingly accentuated her request a voice came from the interior as the girl stood hesitating and shy mind hinny thou'st not take the lady anywhere it isn't safe keep out of the room the captain's leg came through and mind the stairway beyond isn't much to crack on the girl thus admonished turned and led the enthusiastic pair in and up the rich darkness of the stair that's the best part of it her mother told her to leave out whispered the lady that about the captain's leg it sounds most exciting ask her or i will the girl questioned replied over her shoulder it's a tale ma'am a long while back it were ages and ages they do say a man's leg came through the floor and he's always called the capting the boards is rotten just there and was then that whole end of the house is fair gone to powder my grandfather used to say that a man's leg made it coming through but it was long before this time and he was a very old man the ceilings of that part of the house is that powdery would you believe it that we can always scrape the plaster and get a bit for baby how funny and utilitarian and is it haunted grandfather always said twas who by they do say a poor man went clean daft there came home and found every one lying dead about the place but what had they died of plague the smit no nah. grandfather always said twere a tragedy same as they has in the papers nowadays where's your grandfather now she jerked her finger over towards the north churchyard but he knew all about this place his feyther before him was ostler about the inn at redmire you'll pass it on your way to bolton he always said there was a hiding hole here and more'n that a secret way but teacher says that's all nonsense and we mustn't waste our time looking for it besides it isn't safe we shut up this part and just pack into the other where it's still pretty good and at michaelmas we've all got to go out and lord scrope is going to pull the old place down shame oh i dunno it's fair rotten are you sure you can't take us into the rotten part just for once before it all goes that i cannot the worst room is the one the man's leg came through they call it the lady christina's room and it's there grandfather says the priest's hole was it was generally out of the principal room in the house said the man they wanted him under their own hand and to be able to feed him at night come along mary you really can't see it i suppose not she sighed but i do somehow seem to see christina the lady christina i suppose her spirit is about why lady the donnays had no title these people always dignify ghosts and raise them to the peerage let's see if we can't make up a story for her christina donnay and her lover was he the man who went mad or the priest she hid they were descending the stairs their cicerone broke in suddenly nay that weren't the way the real heir was troth plight to the lady christina and he was drowned one day here in the ford here under her very eyes another touch said her companion eagerly so legend grows let us go and sit on the hill here and look towards the ford and i'll try to reconstruct her story for you i'm not a novelist for nothing this is how the man went mad when he came home there was no priest the lover was that little spark in a blue bonnet that fought at preston boswell speaks of i've always wanted to connect him up with a story miss christina donnay not lady was tall and pale and a fine girl so long as she had enough to eat and nothing to brood on but her adolescence and greatest need of nourishment happened to coincide with jacobite times of stress when loyal subjects starved in order that the stewards might come by their own the females of her family were used even hardened to the more domestic consequences of the male's unfaltering loyalty 
when the fuss was about priests christina's own grandmother had successfully concealed one in the hiding-place in her room that very room that we were not permitted to investigate looking towards the ford and the road to richmond to-day her own mother lay there eighty bedridden daft and doited these two women were the widow and daughter of the last donnay of the direct line since the great guy of the canton ermine the race had continually dwindled so many of them had been strangled so many hanged and drawn and quartered a half dozen desiccated heads belonging to the strain had rotted on temple bar cold steel and a touch of poison had been responsible for some others and thus the foolish forlorn race had been cleared off to make room for persons of finer judgment and less realistic ideals acts of attainder recusant fines had impoverished their estates and mulcted them of their goods till of all the broad lands castles and noble manor houses that had bred and sheltered and maintained donnays for the king's service only the austere embattled farmhouse at the richmondshire moors remained and therein the two women that alone bore the fine fighting name slowly pined and withered away they had not enough to eat yet their appetites were no larger than feminine appetites are reputed to be sir christopher donnay christina's father was killed at sheriff muir when his little daughter was a year old and her mother grown doited with the shock lived on to give very little trouble and represent no great charge on the family finances she lay always in her big room in the southwest wing her heavy four-post bed too mighty and perhaps too rotten to be moved remained firm in its old place on the safer part of the flooring the tester was hung by heavy rings to the ceiling her daughter ministering to her slight wants had learned to walk warily round the bed christina daunay was loyal as women are loyal she realized very fairly that this task of the reinstatement of the stuart dynasty on the throne of england had been set by providence on her and hers incidentally carrying with it the doom of extermination set on the race their blind inherent loyalty clustered as it must round the losing side which sucked in naturally these people who always went where their advantage was not and the losing side had drawn in her father her uncle even the man she loved she loved her cousin charles donnay of scanwood scanwood house lay three miles hence on the richmond road charles was the only son of her father's only sister Christina and this young man were early troth-plighted. They were about to wed. But the Stuarts came first. It was the cause that intervened and forbade the innocent bands. Charles Donnay allowed the just impediment and went out as a matter of course. He was more eager for the day of the stranger's crowning than for the morn that should usher in his wedding with Christina, whom he knew and loved. He had left her too easily— folk in the neighbourhood said he was slack christina herself admitted that charles was more of a fighter than a lover but the stuarts called what was a donnay to do she cried sometimes and mourned over her balked betrothal with her only confidant a certain luc donnay her father had had a son but he was not her mother's child luc lived with them his mother had been innkeeper's daughter over at redmire a good girl enough till sir christopher donnay came her way he lived so near at walburn and he was not the man to leave so fair a flower ungathered madame donnay was not a hard woman she undertook the child's maintenance when its mother died and sir christopher fell at sheriff muir luke grew up he was not all there but he was an honest kindly gentle fellow and for the two lonely women he did a man's work about the place. There was not much to do. There was not a beast left in the stable except a wall-eyed, knock-kneed pony that Luke rode into Redmire or Marsk now and then to buy necessaries. They could afford no other servant. The white-handed, proud Christina tended her mother, cooked, and did the inside work of the house. It was all one. When the prince should come into his own, Christina would do so likewise. 
of that she had doubts sometimes especially when the wind whistled over the moor and the stream ran heavy and turbid below the garden so that the ford was ill to cross the prince's final triumphing then seemed surer than her own charles had been away now a long while he had not been assiduous about her for many months before his departure to join the prince he had sent her no message first or last she had even heard of another lady for rumours flew the news of the brief steward apotheosis at edinburgh tidings of the prince's meteoric courts at holyrood had filtered down to redmire and the bar of the inn there preston fight too was mentioned she thought but was not sure that charles had been noticed there now the prince was marching south had marched on that day of december mild and calm and presageless as it seemed christina was ill at ease peevish apprehensive she went about the house-place and courtyard with her ears pricked to the free roving wind that might have brushed her charles's bonnet in passing as he marched south with his troops or weary of this fairy listening she would droop her eyes till they rested dreaming on the waterway below the dip of the hill where walburn hall stood then she would raise them slowly to look a little higher on the level where the turrets of scanwood were just visible nestling in their encompassing woods scanwood was a fine place and would it be hers some day puzzling like a fox that is hunted she snuffed the air and could not tell which way danger or perhaps bliss might come had the prince's army passed them on its way south for indeed the last news luke had brought had been that the stuart heir was marching on his own capital with his victorious rabble of highlanders king george was quaking would not charles if this were so have to pass by scanwood to see to his domestic concerns her mother babbled for ever of drums the old woman would have it that she heard them they've gone by my dear they've gone by oh the bonny lads the prince has gone into england never to leave it again dearie listen to the old doited woman for she speaks truth rub-a-dub rub-a-dub wisht wisht mother christina now and again murmured softly but not imperatively as she stood by the window and herself with her slight long fingers performed the manoeuvre known as drumming on the pane yes her heart lifted he had passed at a point perhaps miles away too far for him to get leave to call in and see his sweetheart she must have patience one day soon she would be looking out of this very window and she would see charles on his fine horse crossing the ford at the old place coming to her with a light heart and all his troubles and hers behind him cast aside healed over and done with she could discern the very spot now where the bottom was nearest and the water shallowest even exposed at times in drought the waters flowed glumly over it now there had been much rain to swell them sometimes to the excited girl who stood there her nerves wrought by the faint vocal rub-a-dubbing that came from the bed behind her it seemed that the water gathered itself up into shapes shapes of horses and men the little waves seemed to rise obediently under the harsh wind and form themselves into the semblance of uncanny humanity they massed themselves and menaced yes she came to fancy that one figure rose again and again from the sullen flow to shake a quivering fist at her she stared the silly vision down soon the water ran by as usual huddling lumping itself into small ridges under the wind but nothing so tall as a man she turned to receive and divert the mother's peevish voice the old woman had ceased to imitate the drums she was now convinced in her senile way they had passed she talked strange nonsense used strange names bound for the south they are the bridge swarkstone swarkstone where's that mother bad luck bad luck the bridge no further swarkstone no further back back i'm cold christina i'm cold 
the day's changing and you feel it said christina sadly altering the position of the coverings it was all she could do nay tis the smit of death i've got christina i know it oh mother not now just when we are going to be so happy but her heart did not back her words look here i'll have luke go to redmere at once and get you some of betty candlish's cordial she promised me some for you the moment i wanted it and you seemed low as you do to-day we won't let you die just yet ay but can you keep me said the voice from the bed gently it's that i've got and no mistake i've felt it all day come back and kiss me christina you're a good girl a very good girl the bridge at swarkstone i saw him there the prince remember that christina yes mother i will though i never heard of such a place in my life cajoled the girl as she went downstairs to seek the half-witted luke and confide her errand to him he sat as usual on the oak settle swallowed up in the glooms of the chimney corner she roused him up and told him what she wanted she helped him to saddle the pony and watched him potter slowly up the hill towards bolton then she re-entered the house and cut up on the corner of the big seamed oaken table some vegetables which she had fetched from an outhouse into a pot on the fire she threw the sliced turnips and carrots there was not much fire to hang over but her forehead got hot her cheeks flushed and her hair escaped a little from its binding presently having put the mess to one side on the hob she walked slowly out into the courtyard to get air of which she suddenly felt a violent need she languidly ascended the few broken steps that led up to the old battlement at that time one could still walk along it without having one's attention too much distracted by the necessity of picking one's way among the rubble she strolled backwards and forwards enjoying the fresh moorland air that caressed her reddened cheeks and blew her pale yellow hair away in an easterly direction holding her hand to her forehead instinctively to restrain it though there was no one to be seen for miles she scanned the country to the south her blue eyes roved over the low rolling hills that let her see a very long way but not as far as that bridge at swarkstone six miles south of derby where the lines of her fate had been converging for several days past and were now radiating away from thence in ragged streaks and strands of fugitive soldiers and brutal complacent pursuers she was overcome with a sudden trepidation a rush of feeling that somehow impelled her to get back to the room where her mother lay and see for herself how the helpless woman was getting on but she sat down on the parapet which at the point where she was still stood firm at the side of the battlement next to the road overcome by a sudden faintness she hid her face in her hands she had eaten very little that day her back was to the road and her eyes should she uncover them would have rested on the empty grass-grown courtyard it was not empty a noise like a dead leaf twisting startled her luke come back on foot without the pony she had pressed her knuckles into her eyes until her eyes had grown hazy and suffused and it was a second or two before she saw there was actually a man in the courtyard below her a man not luke his bonnet faded by sun and wind and rain had once been blue she heard his breath that came quickly and very dryly scenting a beggar and a demand for alms she asked him his business he raised his drooping head. "'Charles! Christina, quick! Who else is here? Can you harbour me?' "'What? What?' "'I come from Darby, the route at Darby. We got six miles beyond and turned back. I am pursued. Quick, can you hide me, will you? They will search my house at Scanwood. They are there now.' Christina was not looking at him. She had half turned when he spoke of Scanwood, and her eyes pried into the bosky mazes lying between. The fugitive thought that the brusque movement had its occasion in a natural change in her sentiments towards him. He deserved no better. He had practically deserted her. He had never written. A woman scorned. Yet in his urgent necessity he must needs appeal to her again. Christina, an answer, I beg of you. 
Shall I go further for a shelter? Take off that cap. Reach it up to me here. Now go into the chimney corner. You know it. Sit down at ease. Not another word. While speaking, she had taken the blue cap and flung it down into the chapel garth on the other side of the wall. The cluster of ramps and fronds of wild garlic parted and opened to receive it and came together again. Meantime, such was the power of insistence in her voice that the fugitive obeyed her as he would obey the military word of command. Heavily walking over the stones of the courtyard, he took his place on the settle in the chimney nook and crossed his legs negligently. He could still see Christina standing on the battlement looking down towards the ford. She stood first on one leg and then on the other. She agitated her body strangely. She made signs. Then faint sounds, voices, the clink of bridles came to his ears from the direction in which she looked. His pursuers, most likely, for the noise came from Scanwood. He stretched his legs, stiff from two nights' exposure, further out in an attitude of ease as she had bidden him. He did not know what Christina meant to do. She was revengeful. Then she would give him up? She meant, perhaps, to save him? Well, his life belonged to her. He waited. Five minutes ago Christina had seen his enemies taking the ford, a well-found troop of horse, and a stoutish personable man riding at their head. Charles Donnay from the Ingle Nook could not see them, but he could see his Christina make a trumpet of her white hands, and hear her bawl, yes, bawl to them over the battlement. "'Good gentlemen, hear me. Will you please to take some refreshment? I cannot allow you to go by me, for it is lonely here at Walburn Hall.' "'Is that what you call it?' said a clear voice. "'Wheel, men!' Charles Donnay saw the speaker ride into the little courtyard at the head of his troop and dismount. He was a fine, florid man of forty or so. He wore a high, fixed cap, with upon it the white horse of Hanover. His gaiters were white, and at his saddle he carried a dead turkey. Christina had descended from the battlement, and had gone to the horse's head. The man spoke breezily. "'Captain Butler at your service, mistress. We will eat a crust with you, the more so because we come to search you in the king's name.' "'Do you say so?' Christina replied, setting the tone of the interview in a way that made Charles Donnay shiver. "'Come you then in, in the king's name. George or James, tis all the same to me, a woman. It's long enough since a man came this way. I was wearying for the sight of one.' The captain laughed heartily. "'Business first, miss, if you please. "'We have a warrant to take a certain Colonel Charles Donnay of Scanwood, "'who fought for the pretender at Preston, "'and gave us honest ones a dance of it.' "'Christina looked faintly bored. "'My cousin of Scanwood! Is he not at home?' "'We have spent two hours ferreting for him there, "'and the housekeeper bade us come here. "'She said he was a good friend of yours.' "'She is cherry of her information.' said the girl composedly. I was more than a friend. I was once sweethearts with him, for my sins. But I have no care for the fellow now, she tossed her head. Come in, come in, you and your men, as many as the roof will shelter. The wine cask is low, but we will do what we can. I am alone here, nearly. My men, some of them, must search the house. I let them search closely. I was always one for formality. But see, they take heed of the flooring of the upper rooms, which is indifferent and might let one of them through, especially if he be a fine man like yourself, Captain. She giggled. Shall I go along with them and indicate the places where the maggots cling and the mouse gnaws and all is gone to fine powder? No, they must shift as best they can, and you shall stay here and talk with me. Our man should be here without your knowledge, perhaps, since you say you and he have fallen out? We fell out, said Christina carelessly, when he chose to leave me to go and fight for a man I had never seen and didn't care for. He should have stayed here and taken care of his own. I am with you, mistress. Little as he is, though, he fought us like the devil at Preston. His blue bonnet was everywhere, and he fairly swinging our poor fellows. The duke is wild to have him strung up, well, men, off with you. 
thoroughly mind every corner is there a cursed hiding hole here yes in my mother's room said the hostess languidly she lies there bedridden speak her fair and gently and she will instruct you to find the way in on the left-hand side of the fireplace a bolt shaped like a beetle only it's iron and if charles is there so much the worse for him you've got the spirit nasty at that well let's in tis hot and your liquor comes not amiss christina led the way under the low-browed doorway to the kitchen where charles donnet was sitting she made straight for the corner where he was and lifting up a wooden flap of the settle rummaged for a bottle of spirits aloud she said get thy great foot out of the way luke wilta ay who's that asked captain butler apprehending the sullen inmate of the chimney corner for the first time that that's a poor foolish cousin of mine she replied rising from her knees with the bottle a little flushed with stooping you seem full of cousins yes but this one's on the wrong side of the blanket he's not over quick but he'll answer a civil question no doubt now then she took charles donnet roughly by the wounded shoulder and he winced look up speak to the captain can't you what's your name asked that personage humorously entering into the spirit of the thing but he got no answer christina shrugged her shoulders truth he's got no name by the rights of it or if he has it's the same as mine luke donnet at your service drat you luke why don't you stand up and speak for yourself still the man on the settle did not move he's taken that way sometimes captain a fit of the sullens as obstinate as a mule and you can't get a word out of him and another day he'll rattle away fit to dreave ye poor sort of company for a girl like me we just have to give him house room and a bite and a sup now and then for kinship's sake she poured out a glass of mead and the captain took up the glass and raised it to his lips a kiss before i drink he put his hand on her shrinking shoulder the kiss lit on her ear the man in the corner looked up sharply be quiet luke don't you see i never gave it she said as if to a froward jealous baby it isn't to his taste eh said butler ha ha never you mind his tantrums captain we never take any notice mother and i she filled his glass again he sat down near the end of the table she made shift to sweep the fragments of vegetables away with the carroty knife but the captain raised his hand let be he said come and sit here if this surly fellow will permit it i shall like to watch his face he put his burly arm out and not before she knew what she was doing proud christina donnet was sitting on the trooper's knee and playing with his beard there was a sound of feet and much stamping overhead presently with a sharp ugly crash of splintering timber the booted leg of one of butler's men came through the ceiling and dangled helplessly christina jumped off the captain's knee and burst out laughing there i told you twould happen bravo tim jobling i'd know his leg in a hundred gad i can hear him squealing like a pig up there tis in my mother's room exclaimed christina suddenly twill frighten her to death you shan't go till they come down they'll be here directly look you it's all right now tim jobling has gotten back his leg they have him by the shoulders and hoist him up so he's still swearing though i can't hear you shall hear me roast him christina did not sit on his knee again but leaped away with a coquettish grimace as the members of the search party came downstairs sheepishly came tim jobling at the tail of the group minded to avoid butler's merriment found not captain except one doited old woman in bed my mother interposed christina proudly ay walters keep a civil tongue in your head it can do you no harm did you put your blade through the bed we did ay the old body sat up and talked gibberish she frightened poor tim that he stepped back sharp and through the flooring his leg came out just there said butler pointing to the comminuted fracture of laths and planks that sagged down from the ceiling well tim you're no worse and you've given me and my young lady here very good amusement your leg wagged like a mouse's tail in a trap my word well well there's meetings and there's partings mistress 
We'll have to be jogging away. Our man's still to seek. What's this place, Redmire? He spoke to Christina, taking her by the chin. It's a lost sort of place, three miles away from here. Marsk's a deal more likely. Yet why should I be helping you to catch the poor escaped fellow? You'll hang him, I'll warrant, and though he's despised me, I don't wish him that much harm. I was never fond of telling the hunt which way the fox had gone. Do you say so? He looked judicial and stroked his beard. After a pause, still, I'll just have the correct name of that place you mentioned. You've no call to be careful for Charles Scanwood. He's given you the go-by, you say. A man merits a rope for neglecting a pretty wench, over and above being punished for the hell he gave us all at Preston. That blue bonnet of his was like the clout of the devil himself. Well, well, adieu. Thank you for your mead, and if ever I'm this way again. Go, since go you will, said she. I shall see or speak to no man but you here this side of Lady Day. So, Captain, farewell. Grant me a favour? Ask it. My cousin here. Sulky face, I. He's got business for me in Marsk. The ford's swollen. We have no horse. Let him ride behind one of your men so far. You're going to Marsk to look for Scanwood? Certainly, miss, we'll oblige. Tim Jobling shall take him behind. Come, men, saddle. We must be off. Give me a letter, so that the next company passes this way don't trouble me, she said. He scribbled something in a pocket-book and tore it out. She took it. Another glass before you go? I'll not say no to that. Here's to King George. Will you toast him? She drank it down. Just a good excuse to get a drink, she said. Right. Women have no call to meddle with politics. And your cousin? You can try him, but I fear he's stubborn. These sullen fits last for days. Here, Luke, drink to please me and the kind captain. She held the cup to his mouth and whispered, Return here as soon as may be. Aloud she sneered, Look you, the great baby. He is suffering me to spill the good liquor. His lips are closed shut. Waste no more time on that lout that will not drink when a lady begs him, the captain said. He wiped his lips. Well, good-bye, then. You were so glad to see me, you'll not refuse me a kiss at parting. What are you thinking of, Captain Butler? she minced affectedly. And before your men, too. Be hanged, my men. They're busy getting off. You're the prettiest picking I've seen since I left my barracks at Hounslow, and I cannot leave it unkissed. He forced his lips. The man in the chimney corner stirred. Touches him nearly, said Butler, whose eyes shone. I could do with another, given freely. Maybe if we were alone. She shook her head. No good, eh? Your promise, madam, was finer than your performance, but I am a gentleman. Come, my lob lie by the fire, stump up. The man in the ingle nook, with one reproachful glance at Christina, rose. He tottered a little and appeared dazed. Captain Butler, in sudden haste to be gone, clapped him on the back. Come, my dear fellow, don't keep us waiting. We're bound to catch our gallows bird before dark. The haggard eyes of the fugitive were fixed now on Christina, and now on the stained kitchen knife that lay on the table. It's the money, she said hastily. I was forgetting. Opening a shabby little leather bag that hung at her girdle, she produced a silver coin. Here, take it, Luke, for all that Betty Clandish would have given us credit. There goes. Don't drop it, you daft goneril. And mind, you'll have to come back by the bridge up Marsk way, for these kind gentlemen won't be coming back, I fancy. It's saving him a matter of two miles, Captain, thanking you kindly, and my mother pining for her drops. The troopers in the yard were all mounted now, their bridles clinking, their horses pawing. Christina standing by Captain Butler's stirrup, bickering with him gaily to the last, watched her lover out of the corner of her eye as he doggedly passed out and hoisted himself up behind the man called Tim. He seemed woefully stiff. Christina supposed him to have a hurt somewhere, or was it merely the result of two nights' exposure? If it was the former, she promised herself a month's delicious nursing. Yet not a look did he cast in her direction as he rode away, uncovered, 
leaving one of Luke's old caps which she had reached down from a nail for him on the table beside the kitchen knife and the carrot scrapings. She saw it when she went in again. His negligence of any head covering must have looked odd and indifferent, but then his sullen and cross demeanour had tallied exactly with her account of him. She was proud of the part she had played. Yet the first thing she did when the sounds had died away was to catch up the rough cloth, not over clean, that lay there and rub her lips with it till the blood came. Then she sat down for a little while with her head buried in the self-same cloth, crouching low in shame, remembering bitterly the indignities to which she had submitted, in order to secure her false lover's safety. Half an hour she sat like this. Then the old clock in the corner struck wheezily. It was three o'clock in the afternoon. She remembered her mother. She ought to go and see and comfort the old woman. Perhaps the rough troopers had frightened her. Heavy-footed, hating herself, loving Charles, she ascended the crazy stairs. The troopers had frightened her mother indeed. She was dead. The daughter, dry-eyed, left alone with death, did what was necessary. She washed the body of her beloved and dressed it and laid her arms across her breast with a little sprig of marjoram out of her garden between the fingers and covered up the cracked, dim looking-glass with a fair white cloth. She went downstairs and procured a plateful of salt, which she laid on the dead woman's chest to fend off the evil spirits. She drew down the blinds of the windows that looked out over the garden onto the ford and sat down near the horribly yawning hole in the floor to await Luke or Charles. Neither of them might come for a good hour or more. She did not know which would be the first. Charles might not come for days, but when he did he would be of good comfort and grateful to her for saving his life, at the expense, though it were, of half an hour's desperate but not irremedial degradation. It was nothing to her, considering the result, perhaps as little to him, and yet more than once during the ordeal she had fancied he was on the point of interposing and forbidding, at the risk of his life, the desecration of the lips that were his, and his only. He might not, perhaps, be willing to kiss her. No matter. She would dress his wound, and shelter him, and be a mother, not a mistress, to him a while. He had not slept in a bed, nurse tended by kind white hands, since Preston fight. He would kiss the hands sometimes. So she dreamed. About five o'clock she heard the thud of a horse's hoofs, trotting briskly towards her from the ford. Charles had been in luck, and somehow or other managed to get hold of a horse. She ran down, leaping, in her haste to go the nearest way, over the gaping chasm that shelved in like the hangman's drop in the middle of the floor. "'My beloved!' A man stood, sheepish, in the house-place. It was Captain Butler. "'You!' she stammered and reeled. "'Yes, tis I, poor fool, come back to know more of you and your wiles, my beauty. For that you are, and maybe, now that I've given my men the slip for an hour, you'll let me have that kiss.' Christina was holding on to the high back of the settle. "'Aye, there's no doubt about it. You're a gay piece, and no one would call you kissing shy. I like it.' But that poor lad who sat there, he couldn't stomach so much freedom, I fancy. You made his poor heart ache, and lost him his wits now, wasn't it? Well, well, he's the best judge of his own feelings. Maybe he's as well out of this troublesome world. What do you mean, Captain? Only that that cousin of yours slipped off from behind Tim Jobling crossing the ford and he was washed away almost before we in the front knew what was happening. It's my belief he did it on purpose. Drowned? Charles? Is that his silly name? I thought you mentioned some other. He said something to Tim, I believe, before he let go. What was it? Oh, if you care to hear. He said that he found the woman he loved was no better than a harlot, and he didn't care for his life any more since t'was so. He just slipped off behind. And didn't anyone lift a finger to help him? She wailed. Couldn't, I tell you. He was a deal too quick for Tim, seeing as he did it a purpose. 
no miss make no bones about it his death lies at your door she tottered and he held out a clumsy hand come put it all behind you why should a fine girl like you sorrow for a half-witted yokel like that you broke his heart but what right had he to cast those bleary eyes of his on you you are for a better than he come now be pleasant you didn't use to look bashful one would think it was a different woman i've come back to you're handsome enough though in all conscience even with that face of thunder on you will you or won't you mistress Donnet? will you come to me my pretty he took a pull at the stoop of liquor that was where he had put it down and held out his arms still the woman stood dazed dumbfounded her ordinarily quick brain acting slowly she began to realize by a series of successive shocks that there was no one left to be helped or saved by diplomacy she kept her distance still eyeing the dark wet knife on the table she spoke at last sombre taciturn my mother lies dead upstairs does she so well twas her time to die wasn't it we'll bury her decently come he sat there glorying in his work his legs well apart smiling fatuously waiting for the fair sulky girl to forget her immediate griefs and fall on his neck for solace and comfort dawdling playing the maiden eh you'll come in the end what if your mother is dead eighty i think she was trooper tim gave her a fright finished her off he was slightly drunk i've left my men at scanwood i fancy its master is likely to seek the old earths after all come still thinking on your mother devil don't i tell you she was old and ripe for death we'll give her christian burial and do all things in order he fumbled in his pockets and christina's hand made a quick outward movement and will you bury me decently too said she advancing at last with the dignity of a queen she sat down on the knee of the amorous captain who fancied the hour of surrender had come indeed he had some small excuse for thinking so for with a gesture of abandonment she flung one long arm round his neck ay but don't strangle me he whispered his chin buried in her bare neck christina's other hand was busy at his coat lapel she found the place just over the collar-bone she had no science but she just happened on it and drove the long kitchen knife in straight its work was not done then with an effort she drew the knife out and used it again captain butler before he fell off the chair saw her eyes glazing and for one moment held a dead woman in his arms and that i think was the way it was said the romancer to his patient listener as they sat together on the bare hillside sloping to the bridge on the other side of the ruined battlement and let their hands run through the cool straggling grasses that clothed its sad bleakness a little he raised his hand that had been fumbling negligently in the ground beside him look here a daffodil this must have been poor christina daunet's garden End of section 9section 10 of tales of the uneasy by violet hunt this librivox recording is in the public domain read by lisa reichert the witness 1 i was sitting over my fire in my hut in penanga creek wyoming when the idea came to me weakly dreamily at first but later on strongly and vividly that i must go home it was as i confusedly made it seven years since i left europe i felt the thing that had driven me forth less keenly and i realized that in seven years things must have quieted down a bit sally too being of a cheerful easy-going make would have forgotten what had happened on that one night since in the nature of the case there could have been no discovery no scandal no one could have known anything about it 
no one had witnessed her act except roger my dog who now lay so quietly numb with advancing age between my feet in front of the fire roger had been only a year old on that short summer night a clumsy floppy puppy that followed me unsteadily swaggering from side to side down the garden path of the old haunted manor house where sally james lived it was flagged with broad white stones and the gate of it opened straight on to the road that led to durham to darlington and to the other ends of the earth where i am now i ran away like a coward and yet not a coward for i loved sally james and i knew too much i turned at the gate and i gazed back at the windows of the house with their closed drawn blinds i thought they looked like eyelids let down over anxious dreams i saw the one window in the oldest part of the house where sally half dressed was peeping through the blind annoyed yet uncomplaining at my departure she knew men she thought i was just going to put my head under the pump and freshen my aching brain and my eyes that had looked on so much since they closed in sleep the night before then after a walk over the common with my dog at my heels i should return to her stay with her through the long years to come and profit by her crime she had rid me of a nuisance she did not realize how could she being hard sally james that i could not bear the thought of seeing her face again she was so careless of other people's feelings that she knew less of what i felt than the silly young dog who slunk at my heels or the pert robin that perched on the cheek of the gatepost the robin with its head on one side seemed to stare at me and leer horribly as i closed the gate behind me and went out into the world for ever i never meant to see sally again i never meant to write or receive a letter i never meant to look at a newspaper again i never meant to know if she were tried for murder or not i only knew that i did not mean to chance having to bear evidence against her there was very little likelihood of that mrs james the bouncing jolly widow and my secret love had saved money left her by her late husband and had managed to buy the freehold of dewlap hall an old manor house that had seen better days it had been one of the homes of the conyers family but it was now little more than a forlorn dejected farmhouse standing alone in a couple of acres about three miles out of durham it looked even a better place than it was once you were inside you saw that its ruin was only a question of time it was slowly crumbling festering powdering away half the rooms were unsafe the walls of the others were shored up partitioned off reduced to a fourth of their original size one floor was taken bodily away i have been told to lay the ghost the sharp jagged rafters sagging downwards from the sides the floor of this room was cobbled it had lancet windows people said it was the old chapel sally used the place as a wash house it opened out of the kitchen which was the old and only hall of the first house that mr wilson the vicar had told us was built in the time of edward the second of course the house was haunted a grey lady sally's bedroom above must have been taken off the whole top of the hall the floor was very bad and though originally it must have been a handsomely sized airy and pleasant room in spite of its low ceiling the late owner had mistrusted the eastern portion of it so much that he had walled it off with boards and some concrete calmly reducing the best bedroom to a cell about ten feet square it was big enough for two people for sally and me drunk with love i believe sally and i would have made love if we had been fastened in a barrel studded with nails and rolled down to the sea but not room enough for three on that night sally and i absorbed in each other had not heard the heavy drunkard's footfall of my wife on the creaking steps of the staircase that led up from the house place below and the sound of the door of the room where we were being slowly pushed open the heavy bolt that should by rights have gone across it was lying on the wicker chair by the bed sally in her wild confidence in the impossibility of molestation in this lonely part of the country 
had omitted to run it into the thole holes on either side of the lintels as usual when you did that you made the chamber into a real castle of strength but she had forgotten all but me and poor mad mary my wife stood like the ghost of dewlap hall and watched us sally half dazed may have thought that she was the ghost anyway she struck out with the heavy iron bar that lay ready to her hand she was strong hardly another woman could have wielded it my dog roger looked up from where he slept crouched on my coat at the foot of the bed on sally's packing box the iron bar was immensely weighty my poor old wife fell like a log roger turned up his eyes i said down roger and roger lay down though a mere puppy he was well trained sally dropped the bar with a loud clang on the floor there was nobody below to hear it it lay there till seeing my eyes fixed on it she picked it up easily and replaced it on the chair without even looking at it but there was no blood or even hairs on it i could have told her for i had got hold of mary by that time and felt her and i was perfectly sure that she had been stunned killed outright so far as i could see the skin was not even broken her clumsy straw hat was of course smashed battered in and her very thick black hair lay like a mat over the crown of her head sally asked me if she were dead and i answered yes stone dead sally shrugged her shoulders as who should say it's fate then without blinking she put a petticoat on over her nightgown and drew the strings of it tightly round her waist till i should have thought they would have cut her but i expect she didn't feel much at that particular moment at least i didn't i kept my eyes on her all the time i thought it might prevent me from going mad and sally was sure to know what to do it was her murder it was a very warm night and getting on for two o'clock i should have thought but no light pierced through the pieces of red gingham that sally had hung up and gathered into a curtain for the window i watched sally she came up to me and took hold of mary's feet and then dropped them again after i had taken the corpse by the shoulders she stood a moment a bit mazed then she thought of the bar and went to it where it lay on the chair by the bedside she lifted it and examined its iron surface give it to me i said i stupidly thought of burning it nonsense sally said quite sharply wiping it on her nightgown and replacing it on the chair let it stay there where it always lies old betty is used to the sight of it she was wise she returned to me and my burden she took hold of mary's feet again and didn't drop them this time but tied a towel round her ankles thus binding them firmly together then both of us breathing heavily we got the body down the stairs i went first i could not see mary's face but i saw sally's and her lips were red and tightly primmed roger clumsily trying to pass us and our burden on the narrow flight of steps got under our feet and nearly threw us down and she unclosed her lips to swear at him if she had not spoken i believe i should have dropped we laid mary on the stone flagged kitchen floor while sally fumbled with the latch of the wash house there was a door out of that into the back yard and thence into a little orchard and out of that into the road which stretched away towards finchale priory at the back of the house to the north it was conveniently full of old abandoned pit shafts i knew that well enough but it was not until we gained the door of the wash house that it occurred to me what sally meant to do and had meant to do from the moment we first lifted mary to bring her downstairs there was a little more light now but still it was not light enough to see and i hoped it would not be until we got into the shelter of the woods sally held the feet as before she swung a lantern by a string from her teeth she had refused to let me carry it sally had not much faith in me at the best of times and now when so much depended on it i could see that she meant to see to everything herself roger followed us he was very humble and submissive since sally had spoken to him so roughly she swore again but not at him for he kept out of her way 
It was when the long brambles caught the hem of her nightgown that hung below the petticoat. Her eyes flashed a little now and then in the light of the swinging lantern. "'I can hardly walk. I've got the bloody hem of my shift so wet,' she said roughly. "'Can you manage?' I asked, speaking very faint. She had said, "'Bloody!' "'Yes. Good thing it's dew, not blood, after all,' she reassured me. "'Don't talk. I've no breath for talking. My word! I sweat and no mistake.' I didn't want to talk. I was thinking of Mary, slung between us, dead as dead. And the last time I saw her she was dead drunk in the streets of Cardiff, reeling about, carrying on her trade. There was no need, that was the shame and disgrace. I was earning good wages at Neath as a colliery man, and gave her her fair share. But she had always taken too much, and never been respectable, not even when I married her. They say those two things go together, and luckily there was no children. As soon as I found out what she was up to, I left her, deserted her, people would say, and drifted to Durham. That was full two years ago. How did she find out that I had come to Durham, and was working at the Elvet Pit? I never wrote to her once. How did she know I was living with Sally James in her house three miles out of Durham? How had she tracked me? I could not tell then, and I don't know now. I was wondering, wondering, and the undergrowth grew thick, and the nut boughs lashed my cheek in the dark. I stumbled a little as we got along with that between us, and I forgot to keep step with Sally, and she swore at me for an awkward fool that was giving her, a weak woman, all the work to do. We came at last to the old pit shaft Sally and I knew of, for it had been one of our trysting places in her husband's lifetime. Most of these disused shafts are walled round with brick, but this one wasn't, for some reason or other. It was carelessly staked round with wattle, waiting to be done properly, I suppose. A drunken man could easily fall in, and no one would be any the wiser. For a pit shaft is so deep that you can see the stars in the daylight. Mary must have walked all the way from Cardiff, it was the first time I felt sorry for her. I had been, till then, so angry with her for coming ferreting and spying, that if you had asked me, I should have said I was glad she had got her deserts. But I could not help seeing the worn soles of her shoes, as we heaved her over the edge of the hole, and they were fairly walked through. I felt sorry for her then. Mary was gone, without sticking or any awkwardness, and Sally breathed hard. She put out her hand and fondled Roger. "'Good dog,' she said. "'He never barked. He won't tell tales of us, will he, pet?' Roger licked her hand as an answer to her question. He was even at that age a wonderfully bright, intelligent dog. Then Sally stooped and tried to pick the long bramble trail out of the hem of her nightgown. It resisted. It was hopelessly entangled. "'Stand on it,' she said, "'while I walk on a bit. "'One can always get rid of followers that way.' She alluded to the old superstition that a girl who attracts the wild wood tendrils will always have plenty of sweethearts. Her white feet were quite bare. I never knew a hardier woman than Sally. She looked down into the shaft once, though of course there was nothing to see. It was too dark and deep down. Then she turned round sharp and decided— "'We had best get back to bed now,' she said cheerfully. "'There's a good piece of night left, and I'm sure we both need a rest.' I caught her up in my arms and carried her home. It was only a little bit of a way, no distance at all, though coming out of it had seemed so terribly long. She liked being carried. Once she put up her mouth and kissed me. I took her in and set her down in the middle of the house-place. She tottered a little, like a china ornament when you've been shifting it. She turned to go upstairs again. I could not manage it. Sally, I said, I think I'll go and get a wash. Do, she said, and you can draw yourself some cider. There's plenty in the barrel in the corner there. I watched her ascend the stairs rather heavily. Then I whistled my dog. The door of the house stood open. The dawn was just breaking. 
I latched it carefully behind me and went away down the garden path. I looked back once, only once. Then I took my resolve definitely. I have never seen her since. I secured a passage out west, and we sailed, my poor dog and I, the very next day. And in my panic I have never looked at a paper from that day to this. I don't know whether there was an inquiry or not, or whether any suspicion fell on Sally. I should say not. She is too clever. Of one thing I am quite sure. The body was never found. They never are when they are lost like that. I have an idea, too, that my wife Mary was never even missed in Cardiff. Who cares when prostitutes die or disappear? If, as was probable, no one had chanced to see her approach Dewlap Hall in the early hours of the morning, then there was absolutely no witness of Sally's crime, except myself and my dog Roger. Yet the thought that plagued me all through that night passes through my mind and worries me still. I had deserted Mary. I had not seen nor communicated with her or any of my friends in and near Cardiff, I am a Welshman, for three years. So how did she know where to find me? Did she settle to visit all the great mining centres in turn? And did she draw Durham early in the game? And when she got to Durham, how did she get wind of my living at Dewlap with Sally James? My thoughts for the last seven years have not been pleasant, but they are all the company I have had. I have worked hard here. I have even had a bit of luck and been able to lay by a little, but I have hardly spoken to a single soul. The last man who spent a night in my cabin was a taciturn Japanese, who had less conversation than even Roger. It is killing me. That is why two nights ago I took up my pen and wrote to Sally. Mrs. James, Dewlap Hall, near Durham, England. I must see her again. And today I have managed, somehow or other, to mail the letter. Now I wait. I waited a good month. Then there came an answer. An answer I had ridden in for to Blizzardville every other day all through the time, speaking to no one except the clerk at the window of the post office, an uncommon dull and slow dog he was. She wrote, You wretch! What a surprise to hear from you! Have you returned to your senses? I congratulate you. Your letter seems to mean that you have, and I don't mind saying how glad I am. Oh, George, how could you walk off like that? And I lying there expecting you to come back after you had had a wash and a drink to buck you up. Men always feel these things so much more than women at the time. As for me, you'd be surprised to hear it, but sometimes at nights I feel as much remorse as you would have me. Only then, when the good daylight comes in at the pane, I feel so different, one would not believe it was the same woman. Morning thoughts always are more cheerful. You see, I can't forgive her for coming to dig me and you out in our happiness. She had nothing more to do with you. She drank. She sold herself. She got what she deserved, even if it was me that gave it to her. I saw it all as I lifted that great bar. She came meddling, and like all meddlesome fools, she got what for. If you had considered it yourself for one moment, you never would have left me like that. But now you have thought it over, and you've thought better of it, and you're coming back to me. Come, only come. All is serene, as I dare say you know. Nobody bothered. William Dysart fooled about me a little when you left the field free, but I treated him with a high hand, and I am shot of him except for a lowering look he gives me over the top of his pew in church on Sunday. They say he is my enemy, but even he can't see to the bottom of a pit shaft, and there's no evidence. I am respected in the place, and I can marry any one I please, and when I please. Shan't it be you, George? Aren't you and I bound by the memory of that night and what I did to get you? Come, your own wicked, level-headed Sally. P.S. I suppose the dog Roger, who was a puppy then, has died a natural death? Poor old dear. I was jealous of that dog. I always felt you liked him nearly as much as you liked me. Peace be to his bones. 
Roger looked up at me as I looked down his way when I came to that last piece all about him. I believe I read it aloud softly. I am in the habit of talking to Roger. He knows perfectly well what one says to him. I stroked him. Dead? Not a bit of it, old dog, I said. We are all alive and kicking, aren't we? Very well preserved, eyes a little bleary perhaps, not many teeth in our head, but those sound, and that's half the battle. Roger fawned on me. He is a quiet, taciturn creature, like his master, and I verily believe the sound of his own voice has got to scare him almost as much as mine does me. You'll come to England with me, old dog, won't you? You and me'll never be parted. She must take us both, for better or worse, eh? Roger's tail wagged. He said nothing, but of course he understood. I could not have left him even if I had wanted to, to die alone in a strange country. Besides, he knows all about me. He saw it all. I can still see him looking pensively down into the pit shaft after... He is my only confidant, for of course I never let on to anyone... I could never risk giving Sally away, but a dog, yes, I am glad he knows. I could not get ready to leave for about a week, and before I started I got another letter from Sally. It must have been written not much more than a day after the first letter, and there seemed no particular reason why she should ever have written it. It was rather incoherent. The thought of our meeting again must have troubled her, must have a little turned her head. She mixed up all sorts of things in her letter and mentioned Roger again three or four times in connection with William Dysart, who she seems to fancy has got his knife into her. A despised lover, but still. I began to fear that the sight of my dog would distress her, remind her of that awful night, when suddenly and without thought or premeditation she up and did a sin for me. What was I to do? It was but woman's nonsense at the best, and I could not leave my faithful beast to pine and starve because of a woman's whim. I consoled myself with the reflection that a hard, sensible woman such as Sally had proved herself to be would not allow any mere fancy to affect her for long. She would force herself to get over it and ignore it, as she had the other. I settled it the way I wanted to and took Roger with me. I made one tiresome discovery on the way home. I was pretty deaf, and could hear very ill unless the speaker addressed himself especially to me, and general conversation not at all. This saddened me. Even a slight deafness makes a man such a nuisance, and I thought it might put Sally off, or even set her willful mightiness against me. Sally was never very patient at the best of times. You see, I thought of everything in relation to her, her crime, and her heartlessness and want of feeling with regard to it seemed not to affect my appreciation of her in any way. Indeed, I admired her devil-may-carishness, because it was, on the whole, the most decent way for her to behave. I should have hated her to whine and snivel. I walked out from Durham one fine Sunday morning in May, Roger trotting at my heels. I had asked no questions about Sally and her circumstances. I knew from her letter that she was well, and, moreover, I experienced some difficulty in framing questions, or, indeed, in getting into conversation at all. I do not believe I spoke more than two consecutive sentences all the way back, and those I mumbled in my beard, for all the world as if I were tongue-tied. No one bothered about me. I expect I was singularly unattractive, and for the most part I was left severely alone. I had lost all convivial habits. I did not care to see or hear anything. I never looked at a paper. My one idea was to see Sally again. Roger was not so unsociable. Indeed, my trouble with him was that he was the reverse. He seemed to be continually getting into conversations, and eventually into fights with other dogs. One dog, a sandy, weedy terrier, lame of one leg, that we met as soon as we got out at Durham Station, he seemed, after having fought handsomely with, to take a great fancy to, and the wretched lame cur chose to follow us all the way out to Dewlap Hall. 
it was disturbing and i should have preferred to have kept my faithful dog entirely to myself at a moment like this i was going to meet the woman i loved again after all these years and only roger knew what had been it was sunday morning and i heard bells ringing at the different churches all the way out sally was standing in the clear morning light at the low door of her house close to the monthly rose bush which stood as high as she did there was but one rose on it she wore a pink cotton dress she had grown a little stouter she held her hand straight across her forehead against the sun which came into her eyes and made her frown or was it the sight of me for indeed her black eyebrows were cruelly drawn down as roger and i and roger's friend came up the flagged path but all she said was as she took her hand away from her face and laid it in mine come in she pulled me inside and shut the door in roger's face he set up a whine poor roger i said in spite of myself and my wish not to annoy her don't you remember him yes but why did you bring the wretched creature here i thought he was dead i understood you to say so she stood there quaking quivering with anger i had never seen sally so unmanned never mind the dog sally kiss me she kissed me then she said thoughtfully perhaps on the whole i had better have him in she opened the door and drove away the stranger dog roger she seized hauled him in by the collar she then carefully bolted the door with one hand sticking to roger with the other have you got a chain what for sally to chain him up i can't have him loose he's been talking to that mongrel of dysart's i know the malicious beast and when dogs get talking together now talking my dear sally oh you know what i mean it was william dysart who directed mary here that night or rather morning he's longing to get his knife into me or you but was there an inquiry i didn't read any of the papers i was so afraid of what i might see there you understand she looked at me narrowly then she tossed her head silly fellow there was nothing to make you uneasy there was not a word of gossip no one knew there was one woman less on the streets of cardiff that's all but you said william dysart directed her here yes that came out in a roundabout way but he didn't know who she was or that she didn't just come here and go straight back again where she came from if only you had taken my hint what hint about roger you do puzzle me sally you only said you supposed he was dead well he isn't that's all and mighty glad i am of it and he isn't used to being tied up and i'm not going to put upon the old dog now i can't help it he doesn't go free in my house we must talk it over meantime she left me abruptly sally never dawdled not even over a murder trailing roger helplessly by the collar she went into the wash house next door i followed her grumbling a little but still quite her humble slave she made his collar more secure and then tied him to the copper then she reached up to a high shelf and gave him a handsome plateful of bones and a pat on the head that had more of monition than of kindness in it roger looked up at me he seemed to understand the situation better than i did keep in with her don't irritate her he seemed to say he shivered and seemed cold tell him to be a good dog and behave himself she said to me and he shall be loosed to-morrow if i can feel quite sure of him things are changed a bit george since you were here and it is easy to see you have not kept pace with them we must brush you up and bring you up to date she was very nervous i followed her out of the wash-house closing the door behind me as she bade me over her shoulder in the living-room she turned and faced me she was a very beautiful woman was sally james her white teeth showed keen as her short upper lip was drawn up from them it made her look fine but a bit cruel she was not a very big woman but stately majestic even at times though she was only a farmer's widow and daughter just now as she stood there her arms at her sides her broad breast covered with pink print was like a queen's she was holding herself in readiness for my first embrace and i longed for it too and yet 
I distrusted her. She was without principle, a figure of shifting sand. She would always do exactly as she liked, and at the moment when she liked. And she hated my dog. I invented excuses for her. It is all association, I thought, as I hung back. She is not so heartless as she seems. The dog was in the room when it happened, and by the shaft when we heaved her over. He reminds her. She has some feeling. My distrust turned all at once to tenderness, and I sat down on the settle and took her in my arms. She was very soft and yielding, and she sat meekly on my knee and kissed me passionately again and again. Then I kissed her back just the same. The tall clock ticked as it did on the night, only louder. There did not seem to be a soul about. I asked Sally if she had no servant to help her. I've a woman, old Betty, do you remember her? Comes to help me all the week through, but she stays away on Sundays. The farmhands sleep nearly a quarter of a mile away. You'll stop tonight, George? I said I would. In my heart, I wondered if her room was still the same. And if I could stand it. 2. A movement in the room awoke me. I opened my eyes slowly, and in the grey light I put out my hand and missed Sally. She had left my side. I put some clothes on and went down the little steep single stairs, lit only by one dirty, cobwebby window. The scanty twilight, for that was all it was as yet, slid in and on to the white lintels, cracked and seamed with age. I never liked the dawn, when people die. The moon was paling quietly in the sky. The morning star still lingered there. At the corner, where the stairs turned sharply, I looked down at my feet and remembered the job we had to get Mary past it. Drops of sweat broke out on my forehead just as they had done then that and the dawn i was very nervous it was nearly the same as that other night sally was not in the house place i stood turning on my heels and wondered where she was i made no doubt that she was walking in her sleep that seeing me had brought back all the sensations of that dreadful night and that she was repeating them perhaps she had remembered the light on the lintel the turn of the stair too what I feared was that she had gone wandering along the same dreary path through the wood as far as the shaft, and then, when she got there, suppose her remorse was too much for her, and she were mad enough to throw herself over. Such things have happened. I had seen the Bells and Macbeth. Sally was rather like Lady Macbeth, and Lady Macbeth, strong-minded as she was, rued her deed, and walked in her sleep, and rubbed her hands. Sally had no blood to think about, only dew on the hem of her nightgown that time. You couldn't tell blood from dew at night. I heard a click, something like the sound made by one earthenware pan rubbing against another in the wash-house. I had maligned Sally in my thoughts. She had merely gone downstairs to feed Roger. The last remark she had made on going to bed was that he looked weakly and on his last legs and should by rights be put away before he suffered pain. Dogs die so hard, she had said. I opened the door that led into the old stone-paved chapel Sally used as a wash-house, and stood the beer-casks in. Sally, in her plain nightgown, was standing there, barefoot on the cobblestones. She looked a bit cranky. Her black hair hung partly down her back, and in elf-locks that were curls overnight in her eyes. She had a great quantity of hair, and out of vanity she never took it all down when she went to bed, but half arranged it with pins and coloured ribbons. Her arm was raised to a high shelf whence she had taken Roger's provender earlier in the day. The movement made the fronts of her nightgown gape and show her breast. She started when I came in and dropped her arm guiltily. "'Go away! Go away!' she screamed and put her hand behind her back. "'Go away and let me finish the job!' "'What job in heaven's name?' I cried, at this hour of night. "'We saw to the dog. No need to feed him again.' "'Feed him, you idiot! Poison him, more likely. Anything to get him out of the way.' I went up to her and laid my hand on her arm. 
I do believe the sight of Roger, who saw you murder Mary, has put you clean out of your wits, Sally, my dear. And what about you and your wits bringing the beast here? She rushed at poor Roger, who squatted at the extreme length of his cord, staring at her calmly, boldly, as if inviting her to stick him with the knife she brandished. He was never like any other dog. He did not plunge or bark. I saved him. I took the knife out of her hand and flung it into the meal-tub close by. "'Fool! Fool!' she yelled. But I put my hand over her mouth and forced her back on the tub so that she sat on the knife. I was so sure she was going mad that it made me calm and strong, and I tried to soothe her and speak gently to her as one does to an invalid. "'What do you want to kill my poor dog for, Sally?' "'I must! I must! He's dangerous!' dangerous without a sound tooth in his head he has a tongue in his head she looked at me narrowly dragging down the outside corners of her eyelids like a bulldog then she pulled the fronts of her nightdress to and tried to speak reasonably she succeeded more or less but it was a great effort to her don't you know what has happened here while you have been away sulking at the other end of the world I said nothing on purpose, so as not to put her back up. She stood staring at me, waiting for me to say something. I was so long she began to shake in the cold, and Sally never could keep quiet for long. Her temper broke out, and she shouted at me. "'Don't look so stupid, George! God, it sends me mad!' "'Dear, try and tell me quietly.' I sat down on an empty barrel. "'Come here, sit on my knee.' She waved me away. She moistened her lips. Don't treat me like a child or a madwoman, George. It is serious, sober earnest. I am telling you facts, not lies. The police, damn them, have got a new weapon, and they use it for all it is worth. She wrung her hands and walked up and down. Oh, to think that all this time we have made pets of these wretched animals, and trusted them. I had a pet dog once. I put it away because it watched me though I wasn't doing anything wrong. Yes, we used to let them go about with us and see all we did and listen to all we said. Who minded talking secrets with an animal in the room or doing anything one liked in a whole farmyard of beasts then? We didn't know that dog of yours was lying at the foot of the bed when Mary was done for. I never even thought of him. We actually let him go with us to the edge of the shaft and see us throw her in. God, what fools we were! "'But what can a dog do, you silly darling?' "'He can get us hanged, get us both hanged. "'Why, your beast there, the very moment he got into England, "'he must have learnt his power. "'He must have blabbed our whole story, "'and to that animal of Dysart's, too, the very last person.' "'I tried to soothe her. "'Sally, my dear, it's awfully cold here. "'You're shivering. Do let us get back to bed.' "'I said that.' but indeed I was getting to be afraid of her, in bed or out of it. She took no notice of me, but went on. You never looked at a paper, you tell me, and yet they were full of it two years ago. The wonderful new discovery. Since then I've never known a moment's peace. My life has been hell. You may thank your stars you were out of it and had left me bear the whole brunt of it. For goodness sake, explain, I said crossly. She came quite close to me and whispered, "'The police! It's a new dodge of the police! I hate them and their filthy methods. They get hold of animals, dogs preferred, because they're more intelligent, and shut them down there in cellars, behind locked doors, and then they torture them, rack them. George, can you bear the idea of Roger tortured, racked, kept without water for a week? Oh, if you had heard, as I have— scores of times only i've run away and said nothing because of my guilty conscience if you'd heard the pitiful howls and whines at the back of the police station there and knew that some poor helpless beast was being made to betray and give evidence but i don't see how a dog or any animal indeed could let on what it knew even if it tried i said as grave as a judge to pacify her Oh, that's a mere matter of detail. The police have got a code. They manage to communicate with the beasts. 
They count the barks. Ha! Ha! I laughed. Don't dare to laugh, you ignorant fool. Have you never heard of those spiritualist affairs? The spirits rap, and the medium tells you what they are saying. Well, the dog barks. It comes to the same thing. She sighed deeply and seemed relieved. It was now quite day. Her candle flared. She was waiting for me to speak. I was thinking of what would be the most soothing thing to say. It would not come. I was at my wit's end. The only thing I could think of was to get her back to bed and send for a doctor. I moved slightly in my indecision. She caught my hand. Hers was very hot. George, what are you going to do? I've explained clearly, haven't I? Quite. I had now fixed on a plan of action. And now, Sally, darling, I said softly, just you get back to bed, and I'll settle Roger, and then I'll bring you a nice cup of tea. That plan failed. She screamed and beat the air with her hands. Settle him? Not you. It takes a man to do that, or a woman like me. No, I know you. You want me to go quietly while you untie the dog and let him go free, to get us hanged. Me, at any rate. I murdered Mary. You only looked on. And your dog? What'll you get? I shall swing for it. He's sure to have told Dysart's dog, and the police'll get wind of it. Dysart'll take care of that. He's only waiting. Has been these ten years. And then they can hulk Mary up, what's left of her, and the damn dog'll tell them who put her there. Do you suppose Roger would betray us? I said, humouring her. She was crying now, violently, against my heart. But, George, under torture, there is no knowing what he might do. Is there, Roger? She left me contemptuously, and, bending down a little, spoke to Roger as if he were a human being. That gave me a turn, and I felt very queer. She seemed so sure of herself, and her tale. Roger appeared to listen. He barked three times, then four times, then more. I lost count. But Sally didn't, apparently. She wiped her eyes on the sleeve of her nightgown, tossed her head back, and cried triumphantly, "'There! He says I had better warn you. He can't be quite sure. He's not so young as he was. His power of endurance is weakened. That's what he says, as well as he can, to me who understand him. Did you notice?' she continued. "'How Dysart's dog limps? Well, that's because, everyone knows it, though it's supposed to be a secret, the police examined him.' tormented i call it a year ago in connection with a case of arson dysart's ricks were set on fire she chuckled who was accused me and did you that's not the point but dysart's dog was got to admit that he had seen one of my men loitering about at an awkward time the time when it happened in fact the police couldn't make anything of his evidence it was too scanty luckily but all the same, he's gone lame ever since. I hate the police as I hate sin. Brutes they are. Roger, good dog, tell me how did you learn the code in this short time? Roger barked gently, a little chain of barks. From Dysart's dog, he says. It's quite simple. Well, George, look here. No, I'm not cold when I'm interested. I'll go on getting it from Roger, and perhaps I'll be able to convince you that for his own sake... Roger had better be put out of the way. He wishes it. I am convinced, I said. I was convinced that she was off her head at this particular point, and that a good rest would set her right. I put my arm round her and tried to kiss her and lead her away, but she pushed me off. Go and sit over there. Don't worry me. I want all my wits about me now, and once you see the danger— if you love me, you won't set the life of an old toothless, worn-out dog against mine, but that's what it comes to. I do love you, Sally. Now, Roger, stand and deliver. Answer the lady. There is no good fighting hallucinations. It is best to humor them. Any doctor would have agreed with me that it was useless to argue with a woman so terribly excited as Sally was. There she stood, barefooted on the stone floor in the light circle that the candle made. 
waving her arms and casting shadows of awful length and shape, the black jagged ends of the rafters of the broken flooring over her head framed her in spikes as they sagged and drooped towards the middle of the room where she was. Nice homecoming for a man after all those years. I wished then, how I wished, I had stayed in Wyoming with my faithful Roger and only seen Sally as I remembered her, plucky, resolute, and sensible, instead of the all-to-pieces madwoman remorse had made of her. But she was determined to go through with the mad farce. She stooped, tossing back her hair, and fixed Roger with her eyes. He met them, as dogs do, without flinching or turning away. Poor dear old Roger was so faithful and so old. I did wish she would leave him alone. But no. Roger, she said solemnly, did Dysart's dog warn you of the state of things here, and of what might happen to you? A lot of little orderly barks answered her, though Roger always did bark when you spoke to him in a certain domineering tone. It was fairly horrible. Sally turned to me, and her voice was lifted with pride. He says, yes, that he is fully informed. Moreover, Dysart's dog has told him that his master has had suspicions of you ever since a certain tramp woman he met on the Witten gilbert Road was so keen on finding her way to you. William Dysart told her she would probably find you in bed with me, blast and curse him. I am glad I burnt five of his ricks. Come, come, Sally, does my dog really say all that? I mocked her. He says that and a lot more. That Dysart went straight to the police this morning after seeing you and your dog walk across the marketplace. Now, then. Damn it all. That's where Roger picked up the curve first, I called out, for I own this struck me. And the dog's manner was disquieting. All this was exciting and very bad for him. He shivered and whined very low. Roger, Roger, old man. I caressed him and talked to him as if he was human and sensible, as indeed he was, but only as dogs, the best of them, are. Don't take on so. What is it? What's the matter? He'll tell you fast enough, Sally said, grinning. She went up to him, too, and passed her hands over his back. Come, tell us all about it, good dog. I couldn't bear to see her lay her Judas hands on him. I shouted, don't you touch my dog, you! I couldn't find a word bad enough for her, not even one of the worst. All my love for her had gone, melted away. All right, she answered carelessly, desisting. So we both stood at an equal distance from Roger, who barked incessantly for about five minutes. I thought I noticed gaps between the groups of barks, as it were, but even now I cannot be quite sure. Sally had got me into the same state as the dog. We were both beside ourselves, fairly bewitched, I think. Now Sally translated in a level voice. Her quiet was more awful than her bluster. He says, Master, save me from the torture. I am old. I have not many months to live. Shoot me first. I may not be able to stop myself from betraying you and her. Shoot me, in mercy, shoot me. Is that so, Roger? I asked him. The spell wrought on me so that I began to believe it. Do you want me to kill you? He barked. Yes, he barked horribly. Then I turned on Sally, and she held up her head and looked me with insolence in the face, and the dog began to plunge and strain on the cord, barking furiously all the time. You devil! I yelled. You are taking me in. This is all a plan. Got up to make me put away my faithful old dog. Look at your dog, she said calmly. He has more sense than you. Do you know what he is trying to do? He's trying to commit suicide. He says it's his only chance if you won't shoot him. You coward! afraid to put him out of his misery and help him out of the way before he's forced to betray you. Go and get your gun. Kill him, man, or let me. I came out of my maze just in time. 
I saw Sally whip the knife out from under her and go for Roger with it. The dog had nearly succeeded in strangling himself. He had come to make gurgling noises in his throat. But I was all there now. "'Don't you do it, old dog!' I up and shouted. "'I'll settle her, as she settled Mary!' And that is why I am sitting here in Durham jail, waiting to be hanged. And a good riddance, too. I don't care to live. Poor Roger did manage to commit suicide. He knew. End of section 10